Hello, I'm Rob Pometier, one of the co-authors of the textbook, Marketing Strategy Based on First Principles in Data Analytics. In this session, we're going to go through chapter two, which is about the marketing principle number one, all customers differ. We have to manage customer heterogeneity to deal with that. The outline or the agenda we have for today, first I'm going to do a little introduction, which you shall recognize if you watch the first session, is very similar. Just sets up and explains why we feel this is one of the fundamental first principles of marketing. Then I'm going to go through in more detail the approaches for dealing with customer heterogeneity. How can we manage customer heterogeneity? How can we develop marketing strategies that allow us to deal with this issue that all customers differ in their needs and desires for products? Then we'll move to the last part. The last pro part puts this into a framework. It's an input, output, process framework that I think makes it clear on how to manage customer heterogeneity. So with that, let's start. All customers differ. The generic idea, the general idea is that pretty much for all marketing products and services, customers' needs and desires vary for the product. We define customer heterogeneity as the variation among customers in terms of their needs, desires, and subsequent behaviors. Because customers' needs and desires change for products, for example, bottled water, customers have different needs. Even though it's HTO, it's the same water. Where it comes from, is it from Canada, is it from Hawaii, is it from Colorado? They're able to market it. What kind of bottle is put in? They're, they're varying across their needs. So how are firms dealing with this? They take the overall market and they segment them into smaller and smaller groups. And then they design a product that meets this exact customer's needs. So what we're seeing happen is firms target smaller and smaller, there's a competitive race on, how, on why and how they're focusing on these smaller segments. Because a firm finds it very hard to compete in all segments equally. You can't be the high-end supplier and the low-end supplier. The high performance and the, and the simple product. The drivers to these trends on how to target, on why customers are different and why firms are targeting smaller and smaller segments, is first, customer needs do vary. If you look at a grocery store, you look at all the different products in a grocery store, you walk down the ketchup aisle and you see how many different types of ketchups. Be it taste buds, people have, some want it sweeter, some want it spicier. Customers have different needs. And marketers spend a lot of money to try to change customers' needs. If you look at Volvo car, they spend a lot of money in their campaign to make the need for safety to be a bigger attribute when people purchase car. And they were very successful about that. That actually was a marketing campaign to make car safety a bigger purchase criteria for families. So first, we know customers have different needs. The second thing, it allows you to respond to their needs, detect and respond to their needs faster. If you focus on one segment of customers, every customer you deal with is, let's say, um, in financial services. Let's think of two firms here. One firm has customers in financial services, healthcare, government, nonprofit. And if something, a new law changes in financial services, do you think this salesperson or this firm is going to pick up on that change very quickly? If on Monday they make a call to financial services, Tuesday it's healthcare, Thursday is a, a, a government, no, when that change occurs, it's only going to be one of many customers. Let's think of a different firm. This firm only focuses on financial services. When their customers start talking about this new regulation change, they're going to hear about it on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. They're going to detect that change much quicker. If the whole management team is focused on financial services, when that salesperson comes in and says, we need to change our product because of these requirements, the management team is going to be very responsive and implement those changes quick. Why? Because all their customers care about it. If you go back to this other firm that sells in all products, first, the market-facing organization is going to be slower to detect it, and second, when they bring that up to the management team, they're going to say, well, 
but financial services only represents 10% of our business. We're not going to implement that change yet. So it's very important to understand if you focus on a smaller segment, you can detect and respond to changes in that segment faster. And obviously technology, the internet, all the databases, the data capture. You look at all the data that Google captures about customers that you can buy. What are they searching online? What's in their emails? They can scan their emails and pull out content. That allows you to better target customers and much more economically. Lastly, you might say, well, then why doesn't everybody do one-to-one -one marketing? If it's really good to focus on customers and all customers are different, why don't you just focus on one customer at a time? Well, to be frank, that would be the best market strategy. It's only limited by the trade-off in the cost of doing that versus the benefits. Let's look at an example of soccer equipment. You can go on and buy cleats online, soccer cleats. You can go on to Adidas and you can buy just generic cleats they sell. Or you can go on and you can customize the color, the color of the laces, the color of the side. I think there's about 10,000 versions, if you took all the different options, call it semi-custom, that you can do for your own cleats. Now they get a premium for that, 20 or $30 per cleat. Now they don't let you do everything different. Why? If you designed it from the ground up, it would be too expensive for Adidas to manufacture a cleat for one person. But they're able to manufacture a cleat for one person because they've automated it if it's only different piece parts and modularly put them together. So that's one step. So they went from selling, let's say, 100 cleats to now they're selling, if you will, tens of thousands of cleats. In many cases, no one else in the world has the same cleat that somebody could buy on the Adidas website. It's not fully customized. You can't change everything, but within the degrees of freedom they give you, you can change it. So you can see this is moving down to be more and more customized. So where do these sources, if I say all customers differ, and there's a high degree of heterogeneity on customers' needs, where does this customer heterogeneity come from? We look at all these different people, and they all have different needs and desires. We're going to look at five different sources of why customers are needs and difference are different for your product. First is individual differences. Psychologists study this quite a bit. Come to find out individual people typically follow a bell curve around most of their characteristics. If you look at their favorite color, people vary widely across the globe on what's their favorite color, how spicy they like their food, all sorts of things. They vary. That's just their individual makeup. If you will, all their genetic makeup put together made them desire some one thing. That's an individual difference. Also, life experiences. So people start being different when they're born. They have a different genetic makeup, if you will, and they have different desires. But obviously, as they grow up and they go through life experiences, they again have different, those life experience impact. If somebody has a food item, and they maybe get sick on it once through food poisoning, very often that person will never want that food item again in their life, or it repels them to a certain degree. That would change their need and desire. They might have been born with a, a desire for a certain type of food, maybe they like seafood, but they got sick on oysters and they would never eat oysters again in the rest of their life. So life experience is the second thing that change. Third is what we call functional needs. If you're buying um, a new stereo, if you're listening to some music, and you're buying it for your living room, you probably don't mind that it has to plug into the wall for electrical power. Why? Because you're not going to carry it around. But if you want this one to take on a camping trip, you're going to need to have battery power. If you want to put it in your pocket, it probably needs to be very small. Those are functional needs based on the usage situation and, and maybe how you're going to use the device. The next thing is self-identity and image. These are especially true for visual items, things that other people can see. If you look at certain groups of people, let's look at you know, people that go by the, the term goth, if you will. They might want to wear a, a you know, dark makeup. They might want to wear leather or black clothes. If you look at motorcycle riders, Harley Davidson, they might want to have a leather jacket. That might be part of their image. And then the last one is marketing activities, kind of the example I gave about Volvo. If you do enough marketing, you can change what people desire about a product. 
you can convince them that that attribute is important. If you look at what Starbucks has done with coffee, in the past, years back, you could walk into some place and say, people would ask you what kind of coffee you want, you might have a choice between regular and decaf. Two varieties. You go into a Starbucks today, how many different varieties of coffee are? They keep coming out with new products, new flavors, new ways to put them together. Lots and lots of variation. Trying to appeal to different customers' needs, and also maybe in some cases, building new needs people didn't even know they had. So these are the five primary sources of why all people differ on what they want for products and services. Okay, so what we say is customer heterogeneity is a fundamental problem that all firms need to address. You can't launch one product to the whole market. I hope I've convinced you of that. But sometimes that customer heterogeneity may be latent or hidden. In other words, you might look at a market and say, well, there's only one product being sold. If there's only one product being sold, maybe there's no variation in customers. I would argue in many cases there is variation in what the customers want, but nobody's found or uncovered what these variants are. And I'll give you a, um, an example here in a second with AT&T and phones. Because in the past, at one time, AT&T was a monopoly in the US, and they would sell one type of phone that was black. The only color they offered was black. So if you looked at that, you might say, well, there's no heterogeneity involved in phones. There's only one type. I would argue, no, that heterogeneity is latent. Why? Because no one's spread them out yet. Bottled water, in the past, there might be one type of bottled water. Beer, if you look at the microbreweries and, and such going on now, you're seeing a real splintering in beer. In the past, 80% of all the beers would be five or six brands. Now it's very much diffusing. So assuming all customers are the same, I would argue, is a recipe for failure. At least in the long term, as the competitors will be better able at satisfying sub-segments with a more aligned strategy. And then when that happens, they're going to peel those customers away. And you're going to be left with just a small group of customers. So the idea that you can go with one product to the whole market pretty much doesn't work as soon as a competitor comes in and peels them away. So market principle one, all customers differ, and an effective market strategy must manage the ever-present customer heterogeneity. And let me give that example I spoke of on AT&T. So for a period of time, AT&T had a monopoly. They sold all phones in the U.S. And, but in 1984, the U.S. government took their monopoly power away and said, let's have competition. At that point, people did not understand the level of heterogeneity in the market is regarding phone service. So what happened? What happened to AT&T when this occurred? By 1991, so what is that, seven years, the company lost 83% of its sales revenue. Why? Well, up until that point, AT&T had a monopoly, and they, they said, we know what's best, and we're going to sell one phone. It was very interesting. They came up with a new phone called the Trimline. You might see it on the wall in, in old movies and all. And they thought it was, it took them 10 years to develop this new handset. And they were very excited because they offered it in five colors. That was how they dealt with customer heterogeneity. Guess what? When they opened up this market, all sorts of other little companies came in and said, no, no, here's a group of customers that I know I can service better than AT&T who's selling one product to the whole market. And one by one, different companies peeled away customer subsegments, representing 83% of their sales. So in this case, before the monopoly dropped, the, the customer heterogeneity in the market was not evident. It was latent. Once they removed the government restrictions, then the true heterogeneity emerged, and people went after each segment at a time, leaving AT&T with just a shell of the business. So the deregulation allowed for entrance of many new competitors to satisfy need. Western Electric was the division of AT&T, which made all the electronic equipment AT&T was the service provider. They actually came out of business in 95. So they lasted about 11 years after the deregulation. They could never adapt to the idea of customer heterogeneity. That was, Western Electric is the company that made this phone and sold this phone for over 10 years until they finally came out with the trim line. Again, like I said, it took 10 years to develop a new phone. 
Now we do very sophisticated products, and they're new iterations every six months. So that's a little introduction. Hopefully what you took from that is you're convinced that pretty much all customers differ as far as their needs and desires for products. Even if it hasn't emerged yet, as a marketer, you can go help find those needs. And that firms are, need to address that in order to build an effective strategy. What we're going to go through now is we're going to talk about the evolution of approaches for dealing it. So how has marketers trained business people on how to deal with this? And then we're going to go through in detail the STP process. So the evolution of how to deal with customer heterogeneity. One thing we're seeing, if we look at the size of the target market, when I say target market, that's the, the segment of the whole industry that you're going after. Initially, there was a mass marketing era. In mass marketing era, which utilized mass media to impale on the entire market. This really began when TV broadcasting came out. You could come out, if you look at some of it, back in this day, the media, there was only a few national channels. At one time, there was three TV channels you could watch on. So if you were a business person selling soft drinks or beer or whatever, soap, you could just go to one of those three channels. If you went to all three, you could see pretty much the whole public that watches TV. But what's happened over time? Now there's hundreds, if not thousands, of cable channels. And if you're looking at the, the explosion of channels on internet, there's going to be even more. We kind of call this narrow casting. It's even got to the point now, many cable companies can vary the advertisement to an individual cable box in a person's house. In other words, we have the capability to send a unique advertisement to one household. Well, they're not doing this for privacy concerns. They can also have detectors on the cable box that can tell the mass of the people in the room to know if it's kids or adults. So they could change the advertisement based on if there's kids watching TV or adults watching TV. Again, they're not using that because the technology is there, but there's issues. So we saw a change in media, and what has that started to happen? People moved from mass marketing, and they got attacked by niche marketers. Niche marketers say, well, now that I can reach a smaller group, let me peel off one segment of customers that want maybe a certain type of beer. So rather than sell Budweiser to the mass market, they're going to go to a a very narrow type of beer, maybe some kind of a more of a microbrewery or something, and go after a niche of people that really want this, this particular taste or, or image. Guess what? Niche marketers took out mass marketers. There are some other things driving this. Besides the change in media, changing in printing and manufacturing. Initially, most things you had to build in big groups. If we went back to the Model T Ford, you could have any color you wanted as long as it was black. The idea of that, it was a lot easier to only have one color of paint and paint all your cars. But technology got better where it wasn't that hard to paint cars differently. Now if we look down here, we can do modular manufacturing. We can also do digital printing. Digital printing was very interesting because in the past, the price would vary a lot based on how many print copies you wanted because they had to reset the print up for every time you change something. With digital printing, the second thing coming off the machine can be different than the first. It costs no difference. Again, that allows you to target smaller and smaller groups. So what was the next shift? After niche, people started saying, I can go out and tailor my business to one-to-one -one marketing. One place you can see that is custom suits. You can get a custom suit for not that expensive. Walk in and the suit will make, you can pick the, the fabric and you can have it designed to, to meet your body type exactly. Another thing that has allowed this shift is the move from phone and direct mail as a form of communication to internet and mobile. And mobile is the next big one. Why is internet? Well, let's say I had a little business and there was only a thousand customers in the US. Before the internet, it would be hard to find and sell to those thousand customers. But now, I can sell out of my garage, I can put up a website, I could buy some Google search words, and when somebody put in my word and searched out, and it wouldn't be very expensive to buy those search words because not many companies are going after a 10,000 person market, the company would find you, maybe do an order on your website, you could ship it with FedEx, UPS, and you have a business. 
You could have never done that in the past because you could have never found them. If you had a mail, everybody in the US, you're gonna do 250, 350 million mailers. So what we've seen is an evolution from mass marketing. And you can look at companies like Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble that tell, sell Tide soap and, and these kind of um, Unilever, selling a lot of consumer products good or consumer packaged goods. They say they do no mass marketing now. Mass marketing is dead. People still do niche and we're moving into one-to-one. -one. I think in many areas, as long as the technology can support it, we know we can find people now. As long as the technology can support it, manufacturing technology that is, you'll see more and more one-to-one -one marketing. So that's the evolution of what we've seen over time. In each case, the market gets smaller and smaller. Okay, so how are we gonna deal with this? You could see when we went from NAS, mass to niche to one-to-one, -to -one, we were segmenting smaller and smaller. We're gonna go through and a process called segmentation targeting positioning. We abbreviate that as STP. And what it does, it allows us to match a firm's offering to an individual segment's needs. The first process, part of the S of the STP, is segmenting. Segmenting is dividing the customer into slices of pie. We're gonna go look at the automotive market again. Let's assume this audience is all the automotive market in the world. The first step is making you all move your seats so you're sitting next to each other based on your desires and needs in an automobile. So we might have the minivan people sitting. We might have the people that want trucks. We might want the people that want sports cars, family sedans. We group them. That is segmenting, dividing the markets into groups of similar customers. If you want to think of the market as a piece of pie, Segmenting is slicing the pie up into pieces. The second step is targeting. Targeting is selecting, and this is unique for each firm, it's selecting the segment to, put my, to focus my business on. So as an automotive manufacturer, I might decide I can't make cars for every segment. That's too hard to compete in all those segments. I'm gonna go after one segment. In this case, maybe I'll go after the minivan segment. To keep our, our pie metaphor, this would be selecting what piece of pie you want to eat. First we slice the market up in segmenting, then we select which one we want to eat. The third one is once I decided now I'm going after minivan and I would select minivan based on how good I am at making minivans versus my competitors and how big the market is and how attractive it is. Then I want to build in the mind of all the potential minivan customers that my product is the best, that I'm the minivan supplier. So positioning is placing yourself right on top of the segment you're going after, based on all the needs and desires they have. It might be brand, it might be price, it might be space, performance, whatever characteristics they care about. So STP is segmenting, targeting, and positioning. So now let's go through each one of these steps in a little more detail. So segmenting, as I mentioned, is dividing the market into groups of customers. But we want to have two characteristics. We want every segment to be very homogeneous. In other words, I want them to be very, very similar in what they want. So that way, when I design a product, it's easy. I go after that segment because they all want the same thing. However, I want the different segments to be very different. I don't want them to be overlapping. Why is that? If I go after the minivan and I place my product right in and there's another segment that's very close, then I'm competing against somebody. I would rather have each of these segments homogeneous but different than each other. Okay, what's the, the next thing? We want a segment on needs. And this is often where I see firms when I do consulting and all make mistakes. We want a segment on needs not on descriptors. And let me describe what the difference is between needs and descriptors. Needs and benefits are what customers care about when they buy your product. It's not their age, it's not their income, it's not their gender education. Those are descriptors. They might help you find the customer, but you want to segment on needs. Because if I include age or income into segmentation, do you think there might be people that are 25 years old that want a minivan? Might, might there be somebody 55 year old that want a minivan? 
Sure. Somebody might have a large family when they're young, or somebody else might want to drive people in their church group. So age doesn't drive. Sometimes they're highly correlated, but it doesn't drive what the customer wants. We want to segment on needs and benefits. We use descriptors to, after we, under, after we segment the market and design our product, sometimes we use these to help us find people because it's hard to find customers in the center of a segment. So remember, you segment on needs. So what are the steps? First, you identify and refine a pool of potential customers' needs. Sometimes you don't even know all the attributes customers are using to make a decision. So we do a thing we call qualitative research. Qualitative would be something like a focus group or interviews. We get a group of automotive uh, auto users and we'd ask them, what things do you look at when you decide to buy a car? What's important to you? Size, performance, cost, color, space, whatever. We list all those attributes. That's the first step. We want to have a pool of needs and descriptions because if we leave out an important one, then our analysis will be faulty. The second thing we do is we're going to collect data. And we're going to collect data from all potential customers, or I should say a random assortment of potential customers. There's a couple things that are important on that. I'm not segmenting my own existing customers. They've already selected. The people in your room, this room are not representative of all the people in the world. You've self-selected. You might be local to this town, local to this school. Maybe it was a university that your parents could afford or you could get into. No, you want a random assortment of potential customers. Why random? What random does for me is when I get an answer, then I can extend that answer to the whole population. If my pool of people are biased, let's say I only look at high income people, is my answer going to be representative of the whole population? Think of it this way. Let's say I wanted to learn about cars because I'm going to design, uh, come out and figure out what car I'm going to go after, what car segment. And I only interviewed people at the Ferrari car lot. Do you think the people that go to a Ferrari car lot are representative of the whole market? Do you think I'm going to find many minivan customers? No. I'd come in and say, hey, people are all rich. They, all they care about is performance, high performance. They're, they price is not a huge big deal. These were the attributes I would find. That would be wrong. I need to make sure my sample is a random sample of the population. Okay, so I collect data from them on the importance of each of those. And then I use that data to segment into three to seven groups. Why three to seven? There's nothing magic about three to seven, but if you're doing this for the first time, that allows you to manage it. If you said, oh, break it into 100 segments, it would be overwhelming to most management teams. So we usually start with three to seven because it captures a lot of the variation in the market, if you're just starting, and it's manageable by the, by the team. But you look at a bank, uh, a company called the Royal Bank of Canada. They started this process in the 90s, pretty sophisticatedly, and they started with three to seven segments, and now they have over 100 segments. Once you get going, you can iterate and keep cutting into smaller and smaller segments. So we break them into three to seven segments. And we do that using a technique called cluster analysis. But often before cluster analysis, I have to do another technique called factor analysis. And let me explain that. And then I'll, I'll go through it on the next few slides. Let's think I did a survey of all of you in this room. Let's say you were a random sample of car users. And I found 50 different characteristics of cars that were important. And I surveyed each of you on all 50 attributes and how important they were. Well, come to find out, some of these attributes might be very similar to each other. So we have a mathematical technique we call factor analysis. What factor analysis does, it groups questions together that people are answering the same. So we might end up, rather than there's 50 attributes that customers care about, we might find there's really five to six, maybe 10, factors that are important. Performance, quality, status, those cost, those might be macroscopic factors. We might have three or four questions that all are really just capturing performance. Zero to 60 and how long? 
What's its high-end speed? How much horsepower? All those things could be questions, but they're all just driving performance. Come to find out when people make decisions psychologically, they make decisions based on these higher level factors. So not only does it help us do the analysis, but it's also how people think. So once we do that factor analysis, I might group those 50 questions into let's say 10 factors. They made it a lot more simplified to deal, deal with obviously. Now I'm gonna go through and run a next second analysis called cluster analysis. Cluster analysis now on those 10 factors will group customers into homogeneous groups. So if you think of both factor and cluster are data reduction techniques. Let's think of if we had an Excel spreadsheet. Each row was a customer, each column was a question. Let's say I had 100,000 customers, or make it more reasonable. We'll be in this room, we'll have 500 people, 500 customers, and we'll have 50 questions. That's a big spreadsheet. When I got done with factor, which grouped the questions together, I had 10. When I got done with cluster, let's say I had five, now I have five customer groups with 10 factors. 50, wow, that's, that's way more manageable. That's what these two techniques do. After we, um, um, we number the segments based on the results and ability to manage, how many we select, we name them. Why do you think we name the segments? We name them so we can keep track of them internally to our business. And always be careful because sometimes it leaks out to the public, so you don't want to call them any kind of derogatory name. Cheapskates or something is not a good segment. Or penny pinchers. These are ones that actual companies have used and got caught on. You might say the value conscious segment is, a, is, I guess you would say, a more politically correct way to call them. Okay, now I just have, I have a, a slide on factor analysis. I've described it, but let's go through it in a little more detail. Because these are two analysis teams you off, or analyses you need to use to do segmentation. Factor analysis is a data reduction technique that can be used to identify a small number of latent factors, meaning they're, they're in people's heads. Sometimes quality or performance would not be just necessarily, you have to name them sometimes, you have to figure out what the factor is. That explain major variation in a large number of observed variables. When to use it? Use it to condense a large pool of potential customer needs. It also reduces correlations among predictors which is a problem in many of our analyses. So overall, it groups similar questions. It groups similar questions. So very often, on almost all of our analyses we're gonna do throughout this book, we often start with a lot of data and we need to reduce it. We reduce it very often using factor analysis. Here's an example from the book. If you wanna look at more details, you can look at this DAT, 2.1. In this case, we had, what did we have? We had um, seven attributes. We did this factor analysis, and this is kind of how the, the output comes. But what we find is, you see, factor one has high numbers on these three and low on these. That, those three factors, diversity, specialty, and price, is factor one, and we're gonna call that product factor. Do you have large breadth? What's the price? What's the specialty? Factor two is about cash back and discount. You see these two are high and the other areas are low. This is about promotion. The last two about delivery service and customer service, that's about service. So we went from seven down to three latent factors. Then when we do our cluster analysis, which groups customers, we're gonna use these three factors. Now I'm gonna go through cluster analysis. Cluster analysis is another data simplification or data reduction technique but this one is for grouping customers together. And when do you use it? You use it when you have a big group of customers with very diverse needs and you wanna seg them down into little groups. So rather than just try to figure this out on my own, the math and the data will tell you how the automotive market breaks down. We wanna discover how consumers naturally differ and cater to their unique needs. There's usually two steps to clustering. First, we do the actual math, if you will, which breaks people into groups, but then we have to study each of those groups and describe what are they like, who are they? Because the math doesn't tell you who they are, it just puts them together. And so you look at a group and you look at their average value of the criteria for clustering and you look at their average descriptor values and you say, who are these people? And then you give them a name. 
Here is a, a, an example, and again, there's, there's more details in the book on this, in 2.2. We're going to look at two dimensions. S assume it's a very simple market. It could be performance and cost. Now, the actual cluster can do this in multi-dimensional space. We're just going to do it in two. So what, the, what it does, it looks at every person, and it tries to ma minimize the distance from everybody in a cluster and the center point of that cluster. So it minimizes all the A's, same for that cluster and this cluster, while maximizing all the B's, the center of the clusters. And it does this with an algorithm. So what it's doing, remember what we wanted? We wanted people to be homogeneous, but different than other groups. So it finds, in this case we're showing three clusters, it finds the three cluster solution where it puts every person, every customer in your data into one of these three clusters, and it picks it in a way to maximize the distance between clusters while minimizing the distance for each person in the center to try to make them homogeneous. And it does that mathematically for you. That would be cluster analysis. When you get done with this, you could see, then you're going to describe them and look at these and say, what do these people look like? And then you're going to give them a name. So that's the first step of segmentation. There's two other analyses that I'm going to go through quick. And this is under 2.4. Discriminant and classification. So what does this do for you? These are statistical techniques for allow you to use the data after you cluster. So let me, let me think about this. Let's say I survey all of you. I use your input. I do a factor analysis to reduce the 50 questions down to 10 factors. I do a cluster analysis, let's say, to come up with five clusters. And since you're a random sample, I know that works for the whole market. But the way I figured out that you are in my cluster, let's say this is my target market, and I know you're in my cluster, is I surveyed you and did all this analysis. But there's millions of people out there that I want to go sell to, and I can't survey all of them. So what I do is I develop a model based on observed data. It could be gender, it could be age, it could be income, zip code, all sorts of data that's publicly available. And I build a model to identify cluster membership using the observable data. If I can build a model, it'll tell me how good the model is at predicting. If I can build that model, we call that a discriminant model, now I can take this model, I can buy information from third parties about income, zip codes, gender, age, maybe their occupation. I can run it through my discriminant model, and we call this process classification. And it would tell me, let's say I bought a data list from a list broker of a million names I could run that million names through the list, through my discriminant model, doing classification. It would tell me everybody's cluster membership. It would tell me what segment each person fell in without me surveying, only using observable data. So in other words, I, I do my initial segmentation on needs and wants. After I come up with a segment, then I use this observable data to, to develop a model to find these people. Now sometimes, Gender, age, income might not be enough. I might go out, have to go out and find other data. Maybe their credit score, maybe where they went to college, maybe where they grew up, whatever the information is, until I finally can develop a model to find these people. So it's very powerful because first I use a survey and all to segment, then I use this discriminant model to find you. Why do I want to find you? Because I might do very expensive marketing treatments and I don't want to spend my marketing dollars on people over here that are never going to buy my product. I only want to play my marketing dollars towards people who potentially could buy my product. So targeting. So we finished the segmentation step. Did that make sense? What we, what we found is segmentation involves cutting the market in a pie, but we're going to do it a little more system, systematically. We're going to find everybody needs and benefits. We're going to do a factor to reduce the number of um, questions. We're going to do cluster to put you together. We're going to name them. And now if I've done that to the market, let's say this room is divided into 10 automobile segments. I have to decide which one, what slice of the pie am I going to eat? Which one am I going to go after? We use two criteria to decide to go after a market. 
We look at the attractiveness of the segment. Let's say there's one segment down over here that only has two, two people in it, 2% of the market. Very often, a big firm might say that that's just too small of the market for us to spend our resources. It won't, it won't help our firm much. But not only do I look at market attractiveness, how big it is, how much money do they have, are they willing to pay a premium, price sensitivity, things like that. But I also look at my strengths. There might be a big segment over there that's the low cost segment. They want to buy the cheapest product out there. But I look at my own firm and I'm located in the US, maybe in California, it's a very expensive place to manufacture. Maybe I have a lot of expensive employees because I have a lot of innovation in R&D. That's probably not a good segment for me to go after because my competitive strengths, I have to build an SCA, right? Sustainable Competitive Advantage. They don't apply well to that segment. So I have to use two factors to look at it, how attractive the market is and how strong I can compete in it. And this uses information from the customer, company, and competitors. An ideal target segment, so an ideal thing about the segment I want to go after, where I want to eat, what segment I want to eat, is it should meet six criteria. Customers have to care about whatever you're going after, so it should be based on customer needs. There should be little crossover competition from other segments. You should be able to execute your market strategy in that segment within your financial constraints. You should be able to keep those customers. You want it to be sustainable target segment. You want to be able to find those customers. It's got to be identifiable and it has to be valuable. Valuable meaning financial. Typically though, while these are the individual details, typically we focus on attractiveness and competitive strength. A GE matrix is a tool for doing that. Here's an example of a GE matrix, and let's look at how we're going to use this tool. It's just a visual tool for doing what I just described. First, we're going to look at competitive strength. We found, here's an example from the book. It has five segments. I guess the smallest segment is seasonal gym members. The biggest gym, the biggest segment is gym socialites. Our firm is good at going after this segment based on what our capabilities are, maybe our brand, our location. We're not very good at going after this. Maybe we're high priced and, and they're different. We're also going to look at attractiveness. Low is at the bottom, high is at the top. So what this shows you is if where we're strongest and the market's most attractive is the upper right hand corner. The upper right hand corner are our best segments. Now you notice that the bubbles are different sizes. We add one other piece of information that's a little bit redundant because it's very well correlated to market attractiveness, but we put the size of the segment up there too, just to give an idea how big it is. So here it's pretty clear. If you were going to go after one segment, which one would it be? It would be the gym socialites. It's big, I'm strong, it's a very attractive market. What's the least attractive? Down here. Now we've made it easy. Very often it's not this cut and dry. Here, we're not very strong, it's not very attractive, it's a small market. So in this case, the second step after we segmented, these bubbles are the output of our cluster analysis in our segmentation process, and we named them. The second step is deciding which one to go after. In this case, we'll decide we go after the first two. Gym Socialites and Fashion Trend Center. They're both big, and we're pretty good at both of them. So the third step in STP, is positioning, positioning. So this is the process of improving. Remember, we want to compete. We want to be able to have a sustainable competitive advantage. So it's the process of improving your relative advantage in the mind of your target customers. So there's a lot going on in that first sentence. First, we've already picked who we're going after. We've targeted. We want to talk about customer centric. It's in the minds of the customers. And we're also picking out, we want to have a relative advantage. Ultimately, we want to make it sustainable. Now, you change your position. So if I went back to this curve, I'm trying to fit myself right in the middle of that, the needs and wants of that segment. We're going to both change our product to fit to what those customers want, and we're also going to market it, be it brands and relationships, to what those customers want. Because I could have, let's say the customers wanted a high-performance car. I just redesigned my car and it's high-performance but my brand used to not be high performance so everybody still remembers my old car 
and they don't think it's high performance. That's going to take a lot of advertisement to change their minds, to show them how high performance. Maybe I'll put some cars in a racing circuit, commercials with James Bond driving it, or whatever the case might be. And nearly everything you do impacts your positioning. Let's go through some examples. Samsung, electronic manufacturer from Korea, a number of years ago wanted to increase its position. It was targeting a new segment of a higher end electronic customer. They wanted high quality, high performance electronic product. Samsung was not seen in these customers' mind. First, they fixed their product. But one thing they realized is they were selling their product through Kmart. Kmart is a US retailer, not really seen as being a, a high end, probably more of a low end retailer. What they realized, if they wanted a high end image, Samsung, they could no longer sell through Kmart. They needed to move up to higher end electronic retailers. And so they dropped Kmart, even though that hurt their sales initially, because it did not fit with their image. You can see all sorts of things firms do. Tiffany's, a high-end jewelry manufacturer, does not have sales. Why don't they have sales? Well, they want to maintain this very exclusive status. How does it feel if there's a sale at 50% off? Let's say you buy this very expensive jewelry. In many cases, you're paying twice the price you need to pay for a certain diamond that you could buy down the street, but it wouldn't come in a turquoise bag. You're doing that because of the status and the brand attached. When you bring that turquoise bag home and you give it to your partner, there's a lot of status associated with that. But let's say you do that process and then your neighbor buys the same, device, the same piece of jewelry at 50% off sale. You can see that undermines the status. So Tiffany doesn't have status. So when you make your marketing decisions, they have to fit your positioning of what your customers and your target market wants. Perceptual maps is a tool to aid in doing this. Repositioning is a process like the process I just described for Samsung where you don't, you're not fitting what your target market wants and you slowly move yourself there. Maybe by doing new product designs, maybe by doing advertising, marketing, changing your salespeople. Here's an example carried over from the GE matrix of a perceptual map. Let's explain this. There's a scale here from edgy to conservative and a scale here from traditional to contemporary. If I wanted to go after the all-American teenager, and this is an example of repositioning for Abercrombie and Fitch. Abercrombie and Fitch used to have a product and they were more like going after the baby boomers. They were not far away from L.L. Bean. They were down here in traditional, pretty conservative. They decided they wanted to move to this new segment, was the all-American teenager. They went through some segmentation and targeting, and they changed their targeting from the baby boomers to the all-American teenager. So they had to make a lot of changes both to their product and their marketing. For a period of time, they used to hire models, that would male models, that would stand out in front of the, uh, and do commercials without their shirt on and their commercials were very edgy. They were trying to move up to this image. That took a lot of marketing spend. That would be a repositioning strategy. But you can see, if I look at this overall, in this case, I have four segments, and I have all the different competitors that are selling into it. This is only in two dimensions. Typically, when you do these positioning maps, you need three or four positioning maps because typically the market has more than just two attributes they care about. But you can see how this is a good tool for dealing with positioning. This is an example of a positioning map from Markstrat, if you happen to be um, using Markstrat along with this. In this case, they have perceived economy and perceived performance. This is a, a segment they're going after. This is where their product is now. Their product is 5-5 five, five on these two scales. In order to get to that segment, they need to move to 9 to 11. So they're going to change the product and increase its performance from 5 to 9. And those are kind of units of at attributes just in this, in this scale. And then they're going to move 5 to 11 on economy. And why? They're going to change the position of their product to better fit their target market. That's the process of positioning. When you get all done with positioning, 
as far as deciding what your positioning strategy is going to be, you want to write a positioning statement. A positioning statement has to answer three different questions. First, who are the customers? You can see if you have a target market, you know who the customers are. The needs and wants of the market you're going after. The second, what are the best needs and what are the needs, set of needs and products and services that you must fulfill? So if I'm going after this minivan market, my market would be I'm going, my customer base is going to be going after the moms and dads buying the minivan, if you will. The attributes might be space, might be two sliding doors, might be, it might even be how it looks too, because they want to be a little sporty. Those would be the, the set of needs and benefits I'm going to fulfill. And then you have to say, why is your product better than competitors for minivans? This is getting at your sustainable competitive advantage. Why is this product best option to satisfy this customer's needs? And why? What evidence do you have of that? It might be some consumer survey. It might be um, some performance attributes, some statistics on, on performance or satisfaction of customers that buy your card. But you want to develop this statement, both for internal use and external use. You might have thousands of employees in your firm. You need to give a positioning statement to all the people. So as they're making decisions on what channel to sell through, what pricing to use, what advertising to do, they'll have this positioning statement which answers these key questions about what you want to be in your customer's mind. If you ever hire an outside agency to develop some creative advertising for you, one of the first questions they're going to ask you, what is your positioning statement for this product? What do you want customers to think about your product? So it's really a roadmap for all sorts of implementation decisions, both inside and outside the firm. Here's an example of JCPenney, a US retailer. And we want to critique it if it's good. We put in boxes the three questions they had to answer. For the modern spender and start outs and the mid-income levels who shop for apparel, accessories, and home furnishings, we offer private label supplier exclusive national brands that deliver greater value than that of our competitors. Because of our unique combination of quality, selection, fashion, service, price, and shopping experience. Well, they answer the three questions, but it's way, way too broad. They're not really making the tough decisions. You need to go after and you need to be more specific. You can't make your positioning statement. The reason I like to use this as an example, you can't make your positioning statement, I'm going to do everything that all the segments want. I'm going to be value, I'm going to be quality, I'm going to be private. You have to be narrow. Why? Because there's going to be some other company that's more narrow that's going to beat you in each segment. So this is a, a bad example. But they do answer the three questions, but they're overly broad. I don't think they're targeted enough. And if you look at their financial performance, it, probably this, as long with other decisions, is reflecting in their poor, poor financial performance. OK, now we've gone through the approaches for dealing with customer heterogeneity. Now I want to walk through our framework. This is the visual representation of information in, processes and analysis, and the outputs you're going to get. So inputs. There's three inputs for all potential customers. Remember that random sample of all customers. I need to know their needs and wants for my product. I also need to know their demographics. That's going to help me identify them after I cluster them. And I want to know size, growth, and perceptions because that's going to help me target. For your company, you need to know your strengths, weaknesses, and your opportunities and threats. Why? When you pick your target market, you want to build on your strengths and avoid your weaknesses. You got to know your competitors' strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats too. Why? Because when you pick your target market, you want to be strong and you like your competitors to be weak. Because ultimately, some of them are going to get after you. Then what are the approaches? You're really going to do STP. STP is the process we use for managing customer heterogeneity. And then you're going to use perceptual maps because they help you picture the marketplace. You could see some of those maps we looked at really gave a picture of all the segments and where we are. And you're going to take the customer-centric view. The customer-centric view 
is the idea you're going to take the view of your customer. What does that customer want in that segment? And you're going to try to satisfy them with a product offering right on top of their needs and wants. Some of the analysis we talked about, factor analysis, cluster analysis, GE analysis, the GE matrix, discriminant and classification. Those are your tools, and they're all described in the book in more detail than I've done here just now, in order to manage customer heterogeneity. What do you get out of this? Probably the most important thing you get out is you get a road map. That's a picture of the whole industry. What are all the segments? And you know the descriptions of those segments. Then you come up with the value, the attractiveness and your strength in each segment that allows you to pick the segment you're going after, the target segment. And how to find those people in the target segment. Third, once you've picked your target segment, you're going to write a positioning statement that's going to very clearly describe for both inside people and outside people of your firm who is the target segment, what do they need, and how are you going to beat them? What are you going to offer them to be advantageous? So this is a visual representation of the process. So what are the actual steps? The steps are pretty self-evident. We talked through. The first one is segmenting. To initiate the segmentation, managers need to identify the key purchase attributes. Then you target. You want to identify what segment the firm is going to go after based on the strengths of your firm and the attractiveness of segments. Then you're going to position yourself. Um, you're going to use all of the aspects of your firm, pricing, promotion, people, branding, all of that you're going to use in order to try to place your product in the minds of your customers right on top of their needs and desires. And then you're going to want to build customer centricity. Let me speak to this a little bit more. It's very nice to go out and do this segmentation targeting, and now I have a strategy. But one thing we found is you have to execute it. One way to execute it is you have to get in your mind of your own employees who is that target segment and focus on them. Many firms do things like this. If they're going after two target segments, they might break their sales organization in half. Have one sales organization going after this group and another going after this group. Why is that? Because that way, that sales organization can be very customer centric. I'm just focused on this group versus merging them together. Even though they might require traveling different distances and such, you want to make your firm more customer centric because that allows you to execute. It doesn't do very good to say, that's my positioning statement, if my firm isn't able to execute delivering the products and services that customer wants in the way they want it delivered. So the essence, here's a quote from ancient Chinese kind of proverb that kind of, I think, captions the essence of managing customer heterogeneity. So let's look at this. The victorious strategist only seeks battle after the victory has be won, been won. Whereas he who is destined to defeat first fights and afterwards looks for victory. Why is this a good fit? That first part before the comma only seeks battle after the victory has been won. This segmentation targeting positioning, we do this before we spend one dollar of marketing resources. Maybe we do a little bit of data collection. But before we do any advertising or promotion or anything, why do we do that? We decide the segment we're going to go after. We decide that decisive point to fight our battles. That's our target market. Then we decide how are we going to fight. We pick our strengths and our competitors' weaknesses in order to fight in that segment. If you just go and design products and launch them to the market, what are the chances? That's after the comment. Whereas he who is destined to defeat first fights and afterwards says, well, how am I going to win? Segmentation targeting positioning is your roadmap for winning before you even start the rest of the steps. That's why we always start the first step in a marketing strategy is segmenting the market. We want to understand the whole market and decide where we're going to fight and decide where we're going to go compete. And that ends the session, second session, which is about market principle one. All customers differ, and we want to manage customer heterogeneity. Thank you.